الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We continue إن شاء الله تعالى from the book رسالة في الفقه الميسر in the last part of the book which is some of the مسائل some of the matters of fiqh that is related to specifically the women as mentioned before some of the rulings are specific for men some of it is specific for women and most of the rulings are for both men and women but here what is unique or especially for women and some of these uh, rulings uh, and we stopped at the 10th point or the 10th mas'ala uh, in the subject of uh, the washing the dead and uh, what's related to women here we're not talking about the chapter of al is or funeral or washing the dead in general but just what is related to uh, to women here inshallah and it's important that we learn it and we teach for us to know and to teach also uh, the women at home or those who are not present uh, about these rulings uh, we're not going through uh, details of evidences and and differences of opinions and things like this, just whatever opinion is there. And then, inshallah ta'ala, in the next level, to expand more, inshallah ta'ala. So the 10th point, he says, It's permissible for the woman to wash, meaning the dead, her son, that is young, the young son, and her husband. So the son, if, an, if he's an adult, it's not permissible. But she, it is permissible for her to wash her husband if he dies, if it's feasible, of course. Because some people, they think it's once uh, death takes them apart, that means they're not, there's no relationship anymore. This is wrong. And this is, there's evidences of that from the Prophet ﷺ. But again, we want to be brief. Uh, this is again, if it's feasible. He says, Ya Jews, right? We're talking about fiqh here. That means it's permissible. But of course, it's not permissible to be in a mixed gathering with other men. I mean, so if she's with other men that are ajanib or not related to her because she wants to be there when her husband is being washed, that's not appropriate. But if it happens that it's only her, I mean, for, to imagine something like this, it's permissible as far as the ruling is concerned. Uh, he says, It's also permissible for her to pray janaza uh, exactly like the men. It's permissible for her to pray Salat al janaza Janaza Salah. Lakin, so this is Mas'ala and this is Mas'ala. All within number 10. Lakin, la yajuzu laha tiba'i al-janaz wa tashi'iya. Here the point of, is it permissible for the woman to follow the janaz till it's buried and she stays there with the men till the dead is buried? He says, this is not permissible. It's not permissible for women to follow the janaza and to be there in the graveyard when they're burying the deceased and to wait and to be even some of them they would try to put even the the dirt on the grave all of that is not permissible for women to be there uh, for the sake of uh, of stating especially in the environment environment that we live in some people would say but i heard or i asked and it's permissible yes many of the ulama they say it's disliked but it's not forbidden i'm just saying that on the side like this but no one would ever say that it's permissible if a woman would go and mix again with men and push with the men and go into the crowd or wail or cry. Of course, these things are forbidden. So if this is known to be uh, what would happen, then definitely it's not permissible. And that's what the norm is. And especially with these types of things, with emotions, also something on the side. If even the wife or the loved ones to the deceased, they want to be in the janaza and following the janaza and so on, if they want to be or to do the best for themselves and the best for the deceased, the loved one, stay home, it's better for both of you. If you stay home, you pray janazah, fine. She can pray the janazah. But she doesn't follow the janazah and wait and so on. Uh, and it's best for the deceased. Uh, if they really care about the deceased, is to stay and to be at home and to make dua. And then the next subject, which is also... A, a subject with differences of opinions. He says here, It's not permissible for her to visit the graves. And this also has uh, any valid differences of opinions among the ulama. I'm just saying that because it's, a, it's the reality that we witness. But it's of a lesser issue than following the janaz. And yes, Aisha, she visited the grave of her brother and things like this. 
so uh, it's best, of course, also to avoid it. But because the Prophet ﷺ said, "Kuntu qad nahiyukum an ziyarat al kubur fazuruha fa innaha to the kirukum al akhir." I used to forbid you from visiting the graves, but then visit the graves because it reminds you of the hereafter, and the reminder of the hereafter is for both, for both men and women. So that's why the, some of the ulama they said it's permissible. So as long as there's no mixing again, uh, not proper hijab, or uh, for example, wailing or doing uh, these types of forbidden things. He says, And the woman is to be forbidden from النياحة. النياحة والندب. النياحة is the wailing and screaming and beating oneself or beating one face. As some uh, people would do these types of ignorant matters. These are from the ways of the jahiliyyah. Tearing the clothes or this extreme emotions with screaming and things like this. Uh, plucking the hair. All of that is from the ways of the ignorance. Even for men, there's also ways of jahiliyyah that some cultures they do when someone dies. And some of it even, it's supposed to be their norm, but they do it only if someone dies. They don't uh, shave their beards. They leave their beards because someone died. This is bid'ah, this is from the ways of jahiliyyah. But they should keep the beard, that's something else. But they only leave it because of, uh, as, as if it's a way of mourning also. So this is from the matters of Jahiliya. He says, This is from the major sins. To avoid all of these things. And even in the things that we said, there's difference of opinions. For sure, definitely, it's best to avoid and to stay away. This is what is best for one's religion. And it's again, it's a valid point. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from any means of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the next matter, so we talked about many masail here. As we agreed in the beginning, we're talking about the mas'ala itself, to perceive it, to understand what it, what is the mas'ala is, regardless of the evidences and things like this. So we talked about washing. Who are the men that the woman is permissible for her to wash? The dead meaning her child that is young child before the age of puberty and her husband. Uh, the salatul janaza, uh, he says here, it's permissible to pray Salatul Janaz. But what's not permissible to follow the Janaza till it reaches the grave and to and buried. It is not permissible to visit the graves and the niyaha and nadbulat al khudud, the wailing and beating one's body or face or uh, all of these types of things from al jahiliya. This is all not permissible. And saying, of course, words uh, that is uh, can lead to kufr. Uh, then after that, wala yajuzu lil mar'ati. Now the subject of Al-Hidad. Al-Hidad is the mourning, is when a woman is in state of mourning or that sadness as a result of someone died. It's only permissible for three days if it's other than the husband. So if uh, a mother or a father or someone like that, she can be in state of that hidad which is that she doesn't put, she, she doesn't adorn herself she is, uh, you know, she's not uh, intentionally doing things to make herself sad. Any human being wants to relieve themselves from any sadness. But it's the fact that she, you know, does not adorn herself, uh, things of that nature. Only for three days, if it's other than the husband. If it's for the husband, then it's mandatory, it's obligatory to have the mourning for four months and ten days, as it's stated in the Quran. Clearly. So uh, if the husband dies, then she is in state of hidad, they call it, for four months and ten days. And what is obligatory upon her? Uh, he says, uh, في بيت الزوجية, She has to القرار, like وقرنا في بيوتكن, to stay in the house of الزوجية, in the house of that her husband was, or the place of her marriage that she was with her husband. When her husband died, where she was, uh, if you know, the house that she was living in when he died. So to stay there for four months and ten days, uh, exceptions is something else, right? We're not talking about the exceptions. She can stay alone. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, she's uh, going through depression. You know, the exceptions is to be dealt with uh, in its appropriate context. But the norm is that she stays for four months and ten days. 
Uh, and this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the wisdom behind it, it's not also the, uh, the issue here. Yes, of course, there's great wisdom, whether it's for uh, marriage or not marriage. It's not about marriage. Even if a woman is 95 years old and her husband died, it is also for her to stay in the place of marriage, in the house, for four months and ten days. Unless it's a necessity for her to go, no one is to bring her any food, for example. She's the one that has to take care of herself. If she has to go then in the morning to purchase things, whatever, and then she come back. And what matters is, of course, that she spend the night there and she's there all the time, unless it's a necessity. So this is uh, for uh, the husband, four months and ten days. To stay in the place, the house of a zawjiya, that means the place of marriage. Not to put zina, that's what the hidad means. She doesn't put zina, she does not put things to adorn herself. Watib, perfume, and uh, things like that. There's no special garment for uh, the ihdad. As some women might think it's to wear black, for example. There's no such a thing. She can wear black, colorful, doesn't matter. This is not. Does not negate the hidad. The hidad is about not putting things on her face and adorning herself and uh, perfume and things like this. Of course, she can she clean herself, of course, and she takes shower and all these types of things is there. But uh, to be away from uh, these types of things that are mentioned. And for the husband, it shows again because of the great right of the husband upon her. The husband, as uh, it's stated, this is something that is clear in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the right of the husband upon his wife is a great right, such a great right. Just the fact that uh, she has a husband. And if uh, a woman dies and her husband is pleased with her, this is one of the means for her to enter the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that we should be proud of, that this is part of our deen. Uh, that brings all kinds of goodness and happiness. And it's of course, it's not just one thing and not the other. We're not talking about those who are uh, evil, and have the worst uh, way of life ever, where they think that it's only upon the women, and then the man can be as evil as he can and abuse his wife. Nobody would ever say such a thing. It's only people that only people that have problems in their understanding, because the deen of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is perfect. The men are commanded to be kind to their wives, istawsu bin nisa'i khaira, wa bin ma'roof, and to be pleasant and to be gentle and to be kind. All of that, both. This is how things work. So, but again, uh, we're talking here about the specific rulings, and that's why we don't have to, uh, when this is addressing the matters for the women, when this is for them, we don't have to say, but they also have to be like this. You know, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to be upon and seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the exceptions is when people living a corrupted life, that's something else, then also it's contained in the sharia, and there are rulings, to, cover, to govern that. But the norm of goodness of people, this is how things should be. Uh, number 11, are we understanding the masail here from, uh, from the fiqh perspective? Ya Jews, la Jews, haram, things like this. He, the subject of tahalli, uh, adorning oneself, lilmar'a an tatahalla bima abah Allahu laha. The woman can adorn herself. Al-hilya is the zina or the adornment. Min al dhahabi wal fidda, gold and silver. What the norm of the women they do, that's allowed for her. So it's only why this is specific uh, for women, because men, it's not permissible for them to wear gold. And it's not permissible for them to wear what makes them imitate women. So for men, why we're, not, why we're talking about men, this is not the subject of men here, but men are not supposed to wear bracelets, necklaces, earrings, name it. You know, anything except the uh, the ring and the Prophet ﷺ used to wear it to uh, make it as khatam to seal uh, his letters والسلام, so it had it had a purpose but the subject of zina right this is can a man adorn himself the word zina is different than looking good person wears nice clothing that's fine he calm his hair that's fine he calm his beard that's fine wash his face I mean all of that is no problem the zina, zina meaning the hilya. I don't know it's the uh, the word, the, the the more precise word to it, which is basically jewelry, makeup, you know these types of things. This is special for women. Anything that a person would put on 
as as zina. This is only for women, and it's not permissible for men. Even if all men are wearing bracelets, it's still imitating of imitation of women, and it should not be done. Okay. What does that mean? All of that is not permissible for men. Wearing uh, things around their wrist, you know, uh, necklaces. It doesn't have to be gold and silver. Anything, uh, thread. That they, of course, if it's uh, amulets and things like this, is of course is in the category of shirk. But unless, say, for example, someone is wearing a watch, that's not zina. Or uh, having keys, for example, sometimes they put their keys. It's not like that. It just happened that when they're walking or they did something. The point is the zina, the the hilia, the zina. Uh, this is uh, only for him. But anyway, we're talking about women, so uh, it's permissible for them gold and silver. Uh, and what is the norm? To them, you would never find, you know, in the subject of what's special for men that they would do th these types of things. This is for women. So, what is uh, the hilya with gold and silver with what's known to be the norm? So, that means she should not do something over the norm. That's why the next ten sentence is she should avoid excessiveness and arrogance. That she would use it as a way to be arrogant or to belittle others and things like this and compete with others and things of that nature. But the norm is, is there. And if this is something permissible for women and not permissible for men, that should be recognized. A man should recognize this and should you know, uh, encourage his, his wife, his daughters to, to do this as long as it's not in front of men, you know, to, which is, makes it, of course, haram. وليس فيما تلبسه من حلي الذهب والفضة زكاء إذا كان مستعملا استعمالا يومين أو المناسبات. The مسألة here about the zaka of the gold and the silver that she wears, because as we know, as we talked about zaka, zaka there is zaka on gold and silver. If it reaches the nisab, do you remember the nisab for gold is how much? What's the nisab of gold? If we're talking about fiqh. We're not talking about what's today's calculations. 20 mithqal. 20 mithqal. And then if you want to uh, translate it to nowadays uh, uh, units, you multiply that by 4 point whatever, then it's 80 uh, grams or so of gold. The nisab of al-fidda, the nisab of the fidda, Two hundred. No, but anyway, so it's a, so here the nasab uh, of the gold and uh, again, so the masala here is about the gold that is used for a daily use. So the woman she has gold not to save money or for uh, she's keeping it as uh, as her uh, part of her money. No, it's just something that she wears on her daily use. There's no zakah upon this, and this masala has differences of opinion. And it's, uh, if a person would say it's best to, if it's more than 80 grams, then give zakah on it, and it's the, uh, the safest way. But this is a valid opinion here. If she's, but if the gold that she's wearing it, not to save money, but she's having it for uh, the daily use, then this is uh, to uh, not to have zakah on it. But this is a mis'ala here. Number 12. He says, يجوز المرأة أن تتصدق من مال زوجها. It's permissible for the woman to give charity from the money of her husband بغير إذنه without his permission. We're not done yet. This is not like the end of the مسألة. Right? So, مما جرت العادة به إذا علمت رضاه بذلك. Which means it is permissible for her to give charity from the money of her husband without his permission to what is the norm to be charity, something simple, something that is known, if she knows that he is okay with it, that he permits such a thing. So she doesn't have to take permission from him every time. If she knows that he'll be okay with it, she can give charity from his money, as long as it's the norm. Not that she would you know, spend all of it uh, but again, with all of this, with all these clause here, so it's permissible without his permission, 
with two conditions. He, uh, he would agree to this, and the second thing is, it's according to the norm. So uh, someone uh, is wants something that is to eat and drink, things of that nature. He says, well, this is one masala. وَيَجُوزُ لَهَا أَن تُعْطِيهِ زَكَاةَ مَالِهَا إِذَا كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الزَّكَاةِ It is permissible for the woman, for the wife, to give from her zakah money to her husband if he's poor. So if a woman is married to a poor man, he is poor and she is rich. Uh, is valid. Or she inherited lots of money and he's poor. And as we know that women in Islam, they have their own separate financial identity. They're not belonging to the husband. She has her own separate financial identity. Right? If the husband dies, inheritance is to be distributed accordingly. If she dies, inheritance is to be distributed accordingly. So if she is rich, and that happened also at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the wife of Abdullah ibn Saud and others. So if she is rich, she has money to give zakah, but her husband is poor. He is entitled to be given zakah, then she can give him from her zakah. Why? Because she's not responsible to spend on him anything. She has no financial. The woman in Islam, she has no financial responsibility as far as rights are concerned in her household. If she has money, that's to herself. It's up to her what to do with the money. And it's not like she has to spend on the household, which is another issue. Right? That's why if the man asks his wife to stay home, he has the right. Because he's the one that is responsibly responsible for the financial being of his household. Can a man says, well, it's not enough what I'm getting. So he would ask his wife to work because she needs to help in the in the in the spending upon the household that's not permissive for him to do to do so she has no financial if she works if she allows her to work and she earns it's her for her own self if she out of her goodness she spends that's fine and that's why again if a, a woman would say well, okay i'm working and it's for all, for my own self and i have no responsibility financial responsibility in the household that's correct but he has the right to tell you stay home and don't work because he's the one that is spending Right, so she does not say, "Well, no, I'm not going to stay home. This is my career. This is my whatever," and she works, and she, the, in the money for her only, and she doesn't spend on household. That's disobeying the husband. It is not permissible to do so. So anyway, so it's uh, uh, to give the zakat to the husband if he is uh, poor that he can be given zakat. Uh, a third one within number twelve: إذا كان زوجها دخيلا. If her husband is bakhil, is greedy, stingy. And what that means, la yunfiq al wajib. He does not spend the obligatory spending because he's responsible for the household, food and drink and shelter and everything. So if he does not spend it upon the necessities, not the excessiveness of things, the necessities that is upon him to spend, and he feels like this and he has the money but he doesn't spend, he says, falaha and ta'khuda min mali bighayri idni. She has the right to take from his money without his permission for herself and her son or her offsprings with what is known to be the norm also. And the Prophet ﷺ approved that. To, and the evidences are clear in this, but we're not getting into the evidences. right? Uh, so this is in the case that he's greedy. He's not, he doesn't want to spend. And this is a right. That means, the, the, the right. that means he has to be forced to spend. So she can take without his permission what is sufficient for her. At the 13th uh, point, the subject of the pregnant woman and the one that is breastfeeding for fasting. And we talked about that recently, that for the pregnant woman and the one that breastfeed, it is permissible for them, al-fitr, permissible for them to break their fast in Ramadan, khafata, if they, both the pregnant and the breastfeeding, feared harm, for themselves or for their child or for themselves only. So if she fears harm to herself, if she fasts, she can break her fast. If she fears uh, harm for her, uh, the child that is breastfeeding or pregnant, then also it is permissible for her to break the fast. He says, In these two cases, uh, she can only make up the days and not the fidya, meaning that if she broke her fast because of her own self, right? She broke her fast because she's worried about her own health or her own health and the child. 
So she only make up the days, right? According to this, how it's mentioned. أما إذا خافت على ولدهما فقط فعليهما القضاء والفتي. But if she fears for her offspring only for her child only, then she is to make up the day, and the fidya is there. And who's the one that gives the fidya? The fidya is the guardian of the child. So the husband is the one that gives the fidya, which is feeding a poor for every day. Clear? So it's easy to remember because why did she break her fast? If it's for herself, then she make up only the days and that's it. If it's for her son, for her child, then she make up the day still. And then also to add to this is al fidya feeding the poor, but by the guardian of the child. He says, he says, هذا بالنسبة الحامل. This is uh, with the pregnant. أما المرضع, as for the one that is breastfeeding, فإن قبل الطفل ثدي غيرها, if her, her child is uh, able to breastfeed from someone else other than her, and she was able, or they were able to hire a woman to breastfeed the child, uh, or he has, a, he has money, uh, then uh, that means they have, they have the means for someone else to breastfeed the child then they can do that and in that case she would not break her fast but can she then give him uh, what do you call the artificial milk uh, the formula instead no so if, if a woman would say well I can give him the formula and not breastfeed him no it's best that he is breastfed and you can break your fast in, fast in that case because this is what's better for the child. Uh, but as they used to do in the past, where, or even if it's present, her sister or someone like that, uh, you know, things like this. People would, uh, if they do that, and then rulings are also, would depend on these uh, as a consequences to these matters. If a woman is being paid to breastfeed, and this is a valid contract, right? She's being paid to breastfeed another child other than hers. Or she's doing it without being paid. Uh, she follows the same rulings as before. So she can break her fast if she fears for herself or she fears for the child. Uh, so no one to say, well, then don't do it and fast. No, if she's doing it, then uh, this is a good thing. So that she has the rukhsa or the permissibility to break her fast. And with the same rulings as mentioned before. With fasting, another mas'ala, sawm al the optional fasting, laysa lil mar'ati an tasuma sawm al bi ghayri idhni zawjiha idha kana hadiran shahida. It is not permissible for the woman to fast optional fasting, not obligatory fasting, optional fasting without the permission of her husband if he is present and he's witnessing. That means he's with her because he has rights if she would ask if he uh, for intimacy and the like of this. Uh, so if he's traveling, then that's fine. She doesn't have to take his permission if he's traveling. But if he's present, she has to take his permission for the optional fasting. Please. Type number 14. It, it should not be for the husband, it should not be for the husband, for the man to prevent his wife from making the fard hajj. Hajj is fard once in, in, in lifetime. She has the means to go for Hajj. He is not to prevent her. And she has the means that means to go for Hajj, to have a, a mahram with her, whether it's himself or someone else, and it's safe and everything is fine. He should not prevent her if it's the first Hajj for her. And if she asked him for it, then it is upon him to give her the permission and to help her to be able to fulfill the faridah or the pillar of Islam that is upon her, which is hajj. Uh, does he have to spend, and he's the one that pays for hajj? He doesn't have to. So it's always out of his goodness, of course, that if he does this, this is a great deed, of course. But again, what is, makes it obligatory upon him is, is when she has the means and she wants to go for hajj and he has, and, and it's safe and everything is there, then... Uh, he should not refuse. As for the optional hajj, he has the right to say no. Especially that if it's going to uh, you know, overtake the rights of himself or the rights of the children. But if it's fard, 
then and everything else is safe and things like that, then he should not prevent her. So this is with the Hajj or the Fard Hajj. Uh, then uh, the rest of the, or all the way to the 19th one, is about matters of Hajj. Matters of Hajj related to women. Very briefly, and again this is in the subject of Hajj and maybe we talked about it before. Uh, as you mentioned here, the woman in Haram of Hajj and Umrah, she wears the normal clothing. There's no special clothing for women for ihram, not even a color. Some women, they like to wear white. Or, there's no such a thing. She, nor, she wears her normal clothing, uh, but is not, she's not to put perfume or smell on, uh, you know, and this is at all times. She is not to wear kofazan, gloves, and a niqab, which fits the face, and a thawb al-mu'asfar, and the, the cloth or the garment that is uh, the reddish, uh, bright color uh, and as we heard before that al-ihram for the women is in her face and hands only so that means she doesn't wear niqab and niqab is what fits the face not what we call niqab today that anything that covers the face no it's the one that fits the face it's like the burqa but if uh, she covers her face from something from above then she should if it's in front of men and she is not to wear gloves so she can cover her hand underneath her khimar uh, and of course no perfume and the rest of the things are forbidden for the for the one in state of al-ihram applies for the women number 16 the one in al-nufasa al the one after birth bleeding or uh, in menses she is to taghtasil she takes a shower and she makes ihram and she makes all the manasik except the tawaf around the Kaaba till she is pure then she would make the tawaf so the woman in hajj or umrah Everything is permissible except the tawaf. She does everything. Of course, she's not making salah, which is, is not to be made up, but she's now making hajj. And the tawaf is one of the pillars of hajj. She waits till she's done with her menses and then she makes the tawaf. Number 17. تُشْرَعْ التَّلْبِيَةُ لِلْحَاجِ وَيَرْفَعُ الرِّجَالُ أَصْوَاتَهُمْ بِهَا وَتَسُرَّهَ النِّسَاءِ The talbiya, labbayk, Allahumma labbayk. This is, of course, part of hajj and umrah. The men, they raise their voice. And the women, they keep it to themselves, meaning silently. They say it, but not loud. Uh, so this is special for women. The woman, uh, when she's making the tawaf, as for men in the first three rounds, for the tawaf of Umrah, or the tawaf of, of Al-Qudum, when they're wearing the clothing of Al-Ihram and exposing the right shoulder, they, uh, they go fast in the first three rounds. Women, this is no such a thing for them. And the same thing for the sa'i, between the, uh, the green uh, color. Uh, it's only for men to run, but not for women. So this is not for women. Anything, the ramal, which is in a tawaf, going fast, if there is space, it's not permissible for women. And the same thing for the sa'i, between the safa and the mom. She does not raise her voice with dua. And she does not push and go into the midst of men to be to kiss the black stone and all of these things, it's not permissible. Uh, and again, when it comes to the rewards, she gets the rewards exactly or even more sometimes than men. So there's no less of the reward for women in these types of situations. Because she leaves it for the sake of Allah and this is the command of Allah. So she got the rewards in full. Even for what's special for women, even in Mecca and so on, if she prays in her hotel room or in the housing that she's in, she get the same reward as the man praying in the Kaaba. And if she wants to go to the Kaaba, sure, should, she should not prevent it, right? But if she, it's different than men, because it's always her prayer at home is what is best for her. Number 18, Al-Halqa wa taqseer nusuk fil hajj wal umrah Shaving and shortening the hair is part of the rituals of hajj and umrah. But for women, of course, there's no shaving for their head, uh, but only the taqseer shortening the hair and the shortening the hair for men is the entire head of the man so if a man is choose to make taqseer not shave shaving is best taqseer is permissible uh, if a person choose to uh, shorten the hair it has to be the entire head as if he goes to the barber shop the entire head but for the women her taqseer is what the tip the last she gets her hair together like this and the the end of it a tip that is bigger as the fingertip 
to cut that much, only that small amount of hair. And if she's having her hair in braids, then from every braid, the tip of the hair from the, from the braid, as he mentions this. وصفة التقصير لها أن تقص من كل ضفيرة. الضفيرة is the braid. قدرة أنملة. The the size of أنملة أنملة is the the tip of the finger. أو تجمع شعرها. Or if she's not having ضفائر ضفيرة, she does not have it in braid, but she gets all of here together. وتقص من هذا القدر. And at the end, just the tip of it is to be uh, cut with the scissors or so. And of course, away from the from men and you know she goes to her room and things like this. Number 19, يستحب تعجيل طواف الإفاضة للنساء يوم النحر إذا كنا يخفنا مبادرة الحيط. The as we said, since a woman if in, in her menses or after birth bleeding, everything in Hajj is permissible except the tawaf. So that's why it's recommended for them to make the tawaf of al Hajj as as soon as they can, so that they don't get the uh, the period or the menses and make them late. So it's, there's a ruling here, it's yustahab. That's why for women, if it's the night of al-Muzdalifah, and we talked about hajj before, it's better for the women to go uh, after the midnight of al-Muzdalifah so that they would beat the men by being there earlier and to beat the, gra- the crowd and to make sure that she makes the tawaf as soon as she can because uh, she might have her menses. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to tell the women to do so to make the tawaf of al-ifadah in the 10th of the hijjah as soon as they can out of the fear for al-hayd so that before the hayd or the menses comes. Uh, and if she is in her menses, there's no tawaf al wada There's no farewell tawaf for the women if she has her menses. Tawaf al-hajj is pillar. That's why they should do it as, as soon as they can because it's a pillar of hajj. She has to wait and she has to make it. But... Uh, if she uh, the last thing before leaving Mecca if she's in her menses then it's okay even though it's a wajib that means for men they have to do the farewell tawaf in hajj and if they don't they, has them, they have to make them or sacrifice but for women if she is in her menses then it's not mandatory upon her and she can leave so this is uh, important also to remember and we talked about that remember in hajj uh, actually there's two masalas left the first one, which is Ashrun, the 20th one, it is not permissible for a Muslim, a Muslim woman, to marry a non Muslim man. It's haram, of course, period. There's no exceptions to that. Whether he is Mushrik, uh, Marxist, Mar- Shiuri, Marxist, or Hin- Hindus, or, or anything, or from Ahl Kitab, or Jew, or Christian, doesn't matter. It's all haram, it's not permissible. And this is clear, there's no differences of opinions like this is consensus. I mentioned the wisdom behind it because the man he has the kawama. The man is in charge of the household and she's supposed to obey him. And this is the wilaya. And this is not the right for a kafir or a mushrik to have a wilaya, to have a, a ruling over the one that says La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And of course the offsprings and things like this. Uh, so this is we're talking about women here. Uh, the last mas'ala here that he mentions. الحضانة وهي القيام برعاية الصغير أو الصغيرة أو المعتوه الذي لم يز. This is also a chapter in fiqh. There are details to it. Who has the right for الحضانة? الحضانة is the what's in English terminology of الحضانة. The last مسألة. Custody. Now, the custody of the child. Uh, usually, when people are married, there's no such a thing as custody because the child is with them. But if they are separated, then who has the right of the custody of the child? Uh, he says here, uh, She has the right to for the custody of the child, uh, whether it's boy or a girl, male or female, as long as they are uh, before the age of seven or so, meaning they're newly born and they're still in the stage of being uh, children. She has the right because she is more caring for them than anyone else. And she is even, if she refuses, she should be forced by the judge or so, as long as as she's competent and she's not going to harm them, of course. And as a general rule in this, if if a judge is looking into the situation, if there's a dispute, the judge should make the judgment based on what is best for the child. So, for example, if the woman is... Uh, have things that prevents her from taking care of the child, then he's not to give the child to the woman, and otherwise she would ruin the child. 
So thing, then it goes to the next in line. So the custody for those who are very young, then it's to the woman, to the mother first. Unless she gets married. If she gets married, then she has no rights. It goes to the one next in line. If she gets married, uh, then the children, those who are very young, she has no right to keep them with her because now she has to, uh, you know, the rights of the husband comes in and things like this. So who do they go to next after the mother in that case? Or if she's not competent? Uh, ummaha, her mother. Her mother. So her mother comes first. You know, usually when people are in dispute with divorce and things like this, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our household and there's children and still young. So uh, the husband or the ex-husband, he wants the children. So say, for example, the wife, she got married. The, the, his ex-wife, she got married. So he says, now the children, I, I can take the children. No, they go to her mother. So he's like, what is the, what is the difference? Her mother is herself, is, is the same thing. They've all, maybe they've been living together. That's fine. But this is her mother has more uh, care for the child than anyone else. So unless, again, it does not fit or she does not, is not present. And that's why it's, there's an order here. And, and at the end, the judge will see this as long as everything is normal. So here's, we're, we're taking the rulings here. We're not taking fatawas. We're not talking about fatwas and this situation versus another situation. No, no we're talking about the original ruling of the mas'al. So the mother has the right. Comes after that, her mother. ثُمَّ أُمَّهَاتُهَا الْقُرْبَى فَالْقُرْبَى Then her uh, mothers, you know, uh, that means the mother and the grandmother and so on. Uh, then the father. After that, if all of that is not there, then the father. It goes to the father. Then the mothers of the father, mother and grandmother and so on. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the mother and her sisters, the mother and her sisters, then the grandmothers. Uh, and then all of uh, his mothers, whether it's uh, the grandmothers and so on. Uh, how do you say it in, in English? Can you, can you read that line? No. No. So is it clear? So uh, to make it easy to remember is the mother side comes first. So the mother, if it's not, then her mother, then the mother of her mother, then you can go up as long as they're there. Uh, then if they're, uh, the one next in line is the father, then the mothers of the father, the mother, the grandmother, and so on. Then the grandfather, then the mother of the grandfather, if anyone is alive, of course. And if all of that is not there, ثُمَّ الْأُخْتْ لِأَبَوَيْنِ Then the sister of who? Of the mother. The sister from both father and mother, the full sister. ثُمَّ لِأُمْ Then the maternal sister. Then لِأَبْ Then the paternal sister. They have the same father, but not the same mother. ثُمَّ عَمَّاتِهِ Then the ends from the father's side afterwards. So as you see, it goes first to the mother's side and then to the father's side. Whatever level there is. ثُمَّ uh, خَالَاتِ Then the ends uh, from the mother's side. ثُمَّ خَالَاتِ أُمِّهِ Then the then the ends uh, I'm sorry. خالات, which is the sisters of the, the, the mother. Then the aunts from the mother's side of the mother. ثم عمات أبي. Then the aunts of his father. ثم بنات إخوته. Then the daughters of his sisters. ثم بنات أعمامه. Then the daughters of his uh, uncles from the father's side. وعماته. Then his aunts. ثم بنات أعمام أبي. وبنات عمات أبي. Then the cousins from the father's side. Then the uh, cousins from the mother's side. ثم لباقي العصبة then the rest of the عصبة those who are related with our female الأقرب ثم لذي أرحامي then if all of that is not there then ذوي الأرحام ذوي الأرحام those who are related to the person without uh, those who are related to the person but with all kinds of females in the middle 
So the uncle and things like this from the mother's side. Then if none is there, ثُمَّ hakim, Then the ruler or the judge and he would decide where to go. Uh, so just have this list is there, inshallah. Uh, the last thing here, the custody, if it's for the mother, but the father is the one that is responsible financially to spend on his child. Uh, the one that is having the custody, of course, they have to be in the age of puberty, they have to have uh, sanity, they're not insane, they have the ability to raise, they are trustworthy, they have manners, they are Muslims. So Islam is important. So if the custody is between the mother and the father and the mother is not a Muslim, that's not the best of the child. Again, if, if there are means to do that, of course. وَأَلَا تَكُونَ مُتَزَوِّجَةً And she is not married. فَإِن تَزَوَّجَتْ سَقَطَ حَقْوَا فِي الْحَضَانَ If she got married, she has no rights. But if she, she can, if they allow her. وَإِذَا بَلَغَ الْغُلَامُ سَبْعًا خُيِّرْ And if the child reaches seven years old, then he is to be given the choice with the one, which one he wants to go to. Uh, the manners and the goodness, this is something else, and they should not uh, treat the child as if, you know, one of their properties where they uh, make them having enmities towards one another. Uh, and all of that is what is best and what's the most thing is to save the religion of the child as much as they can. Uh, we'll stop here. It took uh, too much time. But this is the end of it, inshallah. Uh, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us blessed with what we heard. And if it's uh, very brief, what matters at this stage, and it's very important when it comes to, let me finish the sentence first. What matter is to to, to realize or to understand these masail, not necessarily the rulings of it and the details of it and what if questions in it. No, just these masail, what does that mean? What does that mean? Like this. And and because this is a, there's an important thing in seeking knowledge, it's very important that we know where we're going. right? So it's, uh, it's easy to just keep on talking and to uh, talk about things or learn things that is not in the proper way. Like any other science in the world, nobody would learn engineering, for example, by uh, learning the practicality of it first and how to build a, a building. They have to learn the basics first. So we have to be patient with how the ulama, they make the matter in one step after the other. And as we know that all of this is, is just the mandatory knowledge and to cover some of these masail and fiqh, especially to understand what it means so that the next stage, inshallah ta'ala, We'll have it, inshallah ta'ala, only in Arabic. And we'll uh, study and memorize some of the mutun, inshallah, and to get to perceive it better, and then with the differences of opinions and, and other things, inshallah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will. Uh, we'll take the hadith from the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi, the one next in line, uh, and the uh, 50 hadith of Imam Ibn Rajab. Uh, and then if you have any questions, uh, let me see. What uh, what's the number of where we reached? Should have it ready. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, hadith number one thirty-two. Is that correct? No. Hadith one thirty-two. Hadith one thirty-two. Everybody's ready. Hadith number one thirty-two. عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليقل خيرا أو ليصمت فليقل خيرا أو ليصمت ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم جاره فليكرم جاره ومن كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليكرم ضيفه فليكرم ضيفه so the hadith is also easy to memorize, inshallah, because it's three sentences and every sentence starts with 
من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الاخر which means whoever believes in Allah and the last day then let him do so so if you believe in Allah and the last day then follow these commands as the prophet عليه الصلاه والسلام says فليقل the first one فليقل خيرا او ليصمت then let him say خيرا which is good or ليصمت or be silent and what is the sentence here means if you believe in Allah and the last day that means what that means you need to you ought to be the first to follow these commands it doesn't mean that if a person doesn't do it he becomes a disbeliever no but that means he his iman becomes weak and it's uh, it's also to make sure that this is what comes as a result of believing in Allah and the last day what is what does it mean to believe in Allah and the last day to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's the rabb the lord the one that is worthy of worship and the one that has the perfect names and attributes and therefore he's the one to be obeyed and he has the absolute obedience submitting ourselves to the creator of the heavens and earth right and to believe in the last day that means you're seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in the last day so if a person has this and it's certainty in the heart and it's present in one's heart then a person knows that a word of of mouth Uh, if it's uh, in the disobedience of Allah, this can lead the person to the hell fight. So if he believes in Allah, he would only say what is good. Because anything that is evil, and there are sins committed by the tongue, many of them, and we need to learn that to avoid it, that means a person does not have the fear of Allah. So that weakens a sign of a weak iman. And also that means a person doesn't have the fear of uh, the day of judgment and the hell fight. Awli asmat. So either say good or be silent, be quiet. Uh, don't say things and then regret it afterwards. And that's why as we know that we don't speak unless we know for sure what we'll say is good. Do not uh, put yourself in harm's way by allowing yourself to say anything that comes along. Anything that you feel like saying, you say it, you'll you'll get yourself in, in big trouble. Not everything that you feel like saying, to say it. Not everything in the world that you have to have an opinion on. You don't have to speak about everything that happens in, in the entire world. We can say, no, I don't have to have an opinion for everything. Nowadays, by the things that we watch, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Right? The Salaf of Salih, the early generations of Islam, they did not speak about many things. It's not because they're not able to speak. It's because they believe in Allah and they fear the last day. So not to just allow ourselves to keep on saying things. And we, we become so informal and loose and casual when we talk about things when we're together. People together, they talk about the world, entire world. This dude is this, and this guy is this, and this person is this. And we feel that we're comfortable because we understand everything. Because we watched this uh, person talking about the politics and this talking about something else, we understand everything. Then we start making judgments. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us. But you see how it's related to man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir. Fal yakul khayran awli asmut. Wa man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir. Fal yukrim jara. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, let him honor his neighbor. And ikram al-jar is not just about generosity, but it, it's honoring them. So generosity being kind to uh, not to harm them with speech or actions or smell or anything. Right? And to be there for them if they need help with whatever the norm of the people is. So, and this is part of an iman billah al yawm al-akhir. That means if the neighbor is not doing the same, you're still going to be honoring the neighbor, the neighbor and being kind to them because it's related to your belief in Allah and the last day. So then uh, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him be or honor his guest. So the guest is to be honored. And what with, with that means is not your culture, is not only specific culture that they honor the guest. No, every single Muslim should honor his guest. If you have a guest, you honor the guest uh, to the best of your ability. Whatever ability you have, you know, if a person doesn't have much, then whatever he has, he should honor the guest and to make him feel uh, welcomed and, and uh, treat him with generosity and things like this. And going out of your way to take care of the guest, all of that is part of Believing in Allah and the last day. How is that related to one another? Uh, so that we don't take too much time, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us implemented and to make us among those who follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them.
صلى الله وسلم وبارك على محمد وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم ربنا وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك